Oops, let's get rid of that. Oh, that way. Okay, enough with the technical difficulties. All right, uh, thanks very much. My name is uh, Kieran Lal, I just got introduced, um, but I have a couple of roles. I'm the technical director for uh, enterprise sales or business development at Acquia, and I've also been a longtime member of the Drupal Association starting from the beginning and now serve as the advisory board chair for the Drupal Association. And I uh, also help coordinate the Drupal security team. Um, I've been on quite a journey to get here. Um, I've actually been traveling quite extensively. This is me uh, out for a, a marathon, pre-marathon training run um, at, in, uh, in Paris, France, just a, a little over a week and a half ago. And then uh, as recently as uh, last Sunday, I was uh, in Sydney. I arrived from Sydney yesterday. Um, actually, I'm really looking forward to this in a lot of ways, partially because this is a, a, the trip that I've been on to get here. I started off in San Francisco, flew to London, flew to Paris, then took a train to the Hog, then took uh, another, I like, drove to uh, Amsterdam, then popped on a plane to London, flew home to San Francisco for 18 hours, went to Boston, Massachusetts for a week, then flew home to San Francisco for another 18 hours, then flew to Sydney, then flew to Canberra, then Melbourne, then Brisbane, then Sydney, then Los Angeles yesterday, decided I missed my wife and daughter, decided to fly home um, rather than stay the night, went to San Francisco, hopped on a plane this morning, and I will be heading back tonight. So uh, I'm really excited that this 21-day marathon sprint is over because if that's not resting enough, tomorrow I will be running the San Francisco Marathon um, and, uh, you know, to, to keep things adventurous and fun. So uh, I won't be able to stay too late to join you at the pub because I will be going home taking sleeping pills because my body's still on Sydney time uh, so I can get up at 4.30 in the morning and go run this thing. Okay. <laughs> I want, to talk, I want to talk a little bit about um, revolutions, and, uh, and I, think, I think of Drupal as, as a revolutionary force in the world. This is a, a picture of the Watt steam engine in Madrid, and uh, it was important because that ability to harness power and, and was really what kicked off the, uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution uh, a century, over a century ago. And so that was a technological revolution. There are different kinds of revolutions, though. Uh, this is a picture of Bastille Day, uh, July 14th, just a few weeks ago. I, I wasn't quite there in, in Paris for it, but it's quite a party. And so this was uh, the, the, the revolution in France where they stormed the monarchy and, and took, over, um, took over and, uh, and uh, started a, a path towards liberty and democracy. Uh, we also have uh, Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, so an example of, of, uh, of, of, of people uh, revolting and, uh, and, and fighting for their own liberty. A little closer to home, we've got the American Revolution, a great photo of people fighting for independence, and we just celebrated it just a month ago here. Uh, other revolutions around the world that we've seen, the Bolshevik Revolution, which was a political revolution in 1917, um, and it was started with an arms insurrection in Petrograd, uh, and uh, traditionally dated to October, 20, October 25th. More recently, in, in most of our lifetimes, is the Berlin Wall, and so this was a photo from a revolution in uh, in Europe, and on the Berlin Wall between East and West Germany, representing the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so there are many different kinds of revolutions, political revolutions, industrial revolutions, technological revolutions. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about Drupal's revolutions and what's led to Drupal coming to, to par, to pass, uh, the revolution that Drupal is addressing, the revolution within Drupal, and then what the revolution that Drupal is enabling. So as we look back in the last century, um, we, we saw that we got very good at producing things. Uh, that that continu continuation from the Watt steam, steam engine and the ability to manufacture. And so we were able to take buildings, large physical structures, electricity, telecommunications, and machinery and combine them together to produce, uh, produce products. And as we got even more and more efficient, we were able to um, uh, break things up into supply chains. And so we were able to have lots of different parts all over the place and, uh, and then assemble them, and we put them in warehouses like this, and then be able to uh, be able to ship the parts and allow for different levels of expertise worldwide. And so that was really what the 20th century was very much about, was that hierarchical uh, assembly of parts, distribution, manufacturing, and bringing it all together through a, te uh, a technical and transportation revolution. And as we head into this century, now, now 12 years in, we're starting to see a different kind of revolution, 
a social revolution or a social industrialization. And so, for example, uh, we have organizations like LinkedIn that allow us to connect to each other and uh, uh, keep, keep track of each other, but do business with each other, find, find people that we want to hire and collaborate with. And so, for example, that's my uh, LinkedIn address. And LinkedIn has also uh, started to use Drupal as part of their platform uh, for, social, uh, for social communities and support communities at, at LinkedIn, also as part of their way that they communicate to their public and their investors through Drupal sites that they use. We've also got Twitter, uh, a more of a microblog service, but again, uh, a Drupal user, their dev community, and the way they communicate to their community about the status of what's going on is all done through Drupal. Um, and so Twitter has really been a, a powerful enabler, allowing us to connect in real time. Using hashtags, we can follow and find each other, find common topics of interest. And so that beginning of that interconnection of social is the, is the fundamental fabric, I think, for this next century. And there's a guy who's written a great book on it, a guy named Yokai Benkler, and he has coined this term as what he calls social production. And so he's written this book, and he, he wrote a book called The Wealth of Networks that really talks about uh, how, how networking together allows us to do that. And I actually overheard a conversation uh, here in the, uh, while I was getting ready, and there was a gentleman here up front who was talking about you know, how to find jobs and things like that, and he was, he was mentioning that you should uh, you know, get jobs based on your network and the fact that people who've hired you uh, recommended you as opposed to advertising, and I think that's very much you know why people use these services and look that look those services to be able to have an internet connection or a, a, a linked connection that allows people to get recommendations for them and find out who's doing good, and so that's that's very much true about how we're building this next century. And so I want to talk a little bit more in depth about social production, and so in social production, there's really instead of manufacturing and electricity and and transportation and communications, we really look for other things creativity, experience, and wisdom. And so we see people who are always coming up with creative and interesting modules in Drupal, or designers who are coming forward and putting together beautiful designs for us. And one of the things that I liked uh, in coming into the Drupal project is I used to work for IBM, and our IBM it was very hierarchical. And if I wanted to talk to one of the senior vice presidents of technology or architects, that was very difficult for me to be able to do. But in the Drupal community, if you want to go talk to the people with the most experience, you can just jump into IRC, or you can start communicating directly with them in an issue queue, or contact them as a maintainer of a module. And so that ability to surround yourself with people with amazing uh, experience and, and, and people with great wisdom is really powerful. And so these are the driving forces for what, what people look for in social production. And so when you're creating a work environment or you're trying to get things done, you've got to think about what's the framework in which I construct this form of social production. And so you can't take the most boring problems and just give them to people. You've got to have Drupal shops or Drupal companies or Drupal individual developers who are interested in specific kinds of problems. And so here on the left, we have the, the, the famous Gordian knot as an example of an interesting problem. Where does the knot start? And, and in this case, it, it doesn't. And so we take that talent that, you know, those, those people who are amazing, and we present them with interesting problems because it's not just money that motivates them. They want to work on things that they think are cool. They want to work on things that they think is pa they're passionate about. And so that's, those are the motivators. And so as you're trying to get things done within the Drupal community, think about using these, this social framework to drive and hire employees uh, and, and hire Drupal shops to get the projects that you're working on are done. And so today, you know, we have an amazing ecosystem that's built up around the Drupal community. Uh, I took a snapshot of this this morning. So we're now at 17,320 modules and 19,000 developers, and I sh I'm sure in a few days we'll, we'll, we'll break over 20,000. Certainly, uh, some of you are probably going to sign up for uh, a Git account today. You sign up for an account on Drupal.org, and then be, uh, be authorized to have a sandbox and be able to commit code. And we see a, you know, a huge amount of activity, 3,000 uh, code commits this week, and 5,000 issue comments. And so as we look and we compare Drupal to other organizations or other platforms, you know, what, what Dries likes to say and what I'm a, a big believer in is that it's really ultimately going to be ecosystem to ecosystem. It's not going to be just the software. It's going to be the software plus the people, plus the companies, plus the expertise, and how, do those, how does the strength of those ecosystems compare? And so we're starting to see um, some really strong players in that ecosystem, and I think we should all be really proud of how far we've taken it. We've seen companies like IBM embrace and adopt uh, Drupal for delivering solutions to their clients. Capgemini, a worldwide uh, systems integrator and consulting company, now has over 250 employees delivering Drupal solutions uh, worldwide. And so uh, we're starting to see great adoption. Uh, last November, Dries uh, traveled to India, and I've talked to, I was at the CMS Expo in, in Chicago, and I was talking about 14 different other CMS projects, 
and, and they came out to me and they said, dude, I don't know what you did, but you guys wrapped up India. You know, everybody in India is just locked solid on Drupal. It is the dominant solution over there, and people are learning it like crazy. And in fact, today we see India is the second, uh, the country with the second largest number of downloads after the United States, and it'll probably surpass us soon. So great traction there. Uh, we've got DrupalCon Munich coming up very soon, and we had a huge uh, success of DrupalCon London, which sold out uh, last year, and so we uh, hope to see us break 2,000 people. And then we have hundreds of camps worldwide, so lots of local geographies. And here in the LA and San Diego area, you probably have eight or nine camps, or eight or nine user groups uh, up and down uh, Southern California. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to talk a little bit next about, uh, I want to talk a little bit next, uh, we've talked about how the revolution that's led up to Drupal and building this really amazing ecosystem. So I want to talk about how Drupal is addressing uh, a revolution that's going on today. And so that's certainly the mobile, uh, the mobile revolution. We see huge changes going on out there, and there's lots of different components that are making Drupal uh, adaptable to Drupal adaptable to the mobile revolution. So for, for native clients, an iOS or an Android client, we see people using RSS feeds, views feeds, services module to be able to send transactions back and forth between those clients. Some people are doing integration with Node.js so they can have real-time real -time interactivity with mobile clients. Um, other folks are using HTML5 and uh, they're doing responsive design so the browser automatically detects how, what size of screen display the user has and be able to adapt to it. And we've seen a good good distribution of mobile themes or responsive-based themes that have been made available in the Drupal community. Certainly Omega is one of them, and, and Zen and a few others have really done that. And one of the things I like to encourage folks to do today is if they're not sure what to do in their mobile strategy, obviously some of you here are giving presentations on mobile. Some of you are already have decided to do, develop mobile properties. But one of the things I encourage all of uh, the people I work with and the people I interact with is to go ahead and take a look at their uh, Google Analytics or whatever analytics package they have to try to get a sense of how much traffic is uh, how much traffic is mobile? Anyone have a guess of how much worldwide traffic is mobile today? Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Okay. Sixty percent. Okay. Um, so I pulled this off of Mary Meeker's presentation from Kleiner Perkins, and so they were showing uh, approximately as of May 20, uh, 2012, uh, worldwide global traffic is about climbing to about ten percent rapid growth. But I think maybe realistically for the markets that we're serving. Uh, here, here in the Los Angeles area, um, that we're going to see a much more savvy group, and we see that mobile penetration in the United States is probably closer to 80 percent. Um, so it's very likely that you're seeing 30 to 60 percent of your traffic being mobile. And so this is really changing the world and changing what we've got to do. And so uh, organizations are starting to look and say, well, how do we adapt to uh, this mobile revolution? It's really changing at an unprecedented pace. And a common number I hear is an increase of 1 percent per month is what folks see. And so today, we see, uh, we see uh, organizations starting to adopt Drupal for mobile platforms. And so a good example is NBC Olympics. NBC has spent hundreds of millions of dollars for the rights to broadcast to the U.S., and they think over 200 million people in the United States will watch the Olympics over these next 11 days. I think it's 12, 14 days event, and it started yesterday, or at least depends on what time zone you're in when it started. Um, <laughs> but it's going. And so they needed to get a mobile client out. And, uh, and so they turned to Drupal to be able to get this mobile client out. And there's an amazing feeds back end to this that's pulling in feeds. And you know, sports, sports people are really fanatical about being able to get things in real time. So having to be able to pull in feeds from very complex timing systems uh, that measure down to the microsecond and being able to get that pulled into the mobile client has been incredibly uh, an interesting challenge. And so this has been developed and, uh, and deployed. We've also um, started to see lots of organizations look at social trends, and so social trends to be driving. And Drupal historically uh, had an advantage because it was built as a, uh, a bulletin board initially for people in college dormitory, so everybody got a user account, unlike many CMSs that were built. And so today what we see are lots of organizations uh, trying to do social experiments, trying to integrate tweet, Twitter feeds, trying to have blogs, and certainly Drupal's rapid adoption of blogs showed how versatile it was early on. I was just in Australia um, last week, and I was visiting one of the largest insurance companies in the country there, uh, inter the ins Insurance Australia Group, and they had a number of brands. And what they had done was uh, they actually used uh, the Facebook modules for Drupal and then gave that to their marketing teams and allowed them to publish their social pages on Facebook using Drupal. And so prior to that, what they were had to do was they had to contract with a digital agency, write up the text that they wanted, contact go to the digital agency, and then they would update the Facebook pages and have all the dynamic components in it. Today, they just log into their local Drupal account, 
see all the fields that are in their Facebook application are able to rapidly update and publish content to their Facebook pages, and that's cut out the need for a digital agency. It's huge savings for them, and it's driving a great amount of traffic and reaching out to audiences that they couldn't see before. And so this has given them a real key innovative advantage. And so what we see is 91% of uh, organizations will, uh, will have third-party social network sites. So people are going to stand up their company pages on these so social network sites. And so as we look into that, we see all kinds of different social networks that are there. And so it's really critical that Drupal play nicely with them, uh, not necessarily compete as an independent social network. And so this is an example of uh, the different kinds of logins that you could potentially have uh, within Drupal or different kinds of social services that you could have a widget or an embed into your Drupal site. And so uh, Warner Brothers Music, uh, Warner Music Group has got a number of artists. And so one of the most popular artists is Bruno Mars. And so you can see up here in the top right corner, is uh, the ability to log in to a Drupal site using Facebook. And so they allow you to log in with Facebook or Twitter. And so that ability to log in, publish to the Drupal site, and then simultaneously publish out to a social network is exactly the kind of traffic that they want to drive. And so that's really helping, helping to do that. We're also seeing, um, we're also seeing uh, uh, a really interesting trend that's broadly being referred to as web engagement management. And so when we talked earlier, when I first started talking, I talked about the supply chain network. And so you know, 20, 30 years into the supply chain research, we've gotten really good about getting tomatoes from Chile, let's say, or getting apples from New Zealand. And we can have very sophisticated software to do that. But when we look at the way websites are built today, a lot of people have a CRM system that's completely disconnected from their website. They have a marketing management system and a lead generation system that's completely independent. And it's difficult for them to be able to go back and track when, when a customer comes to buy something from me, did they come through on the telephone? Did they come through on Twitter? Did they come through on Facebook? Was it a personal referral? And so their ability to be able to track what's going on through their site has become a real challenge. And so we're starting to see uh, a lot of organizations say, how are we going to integrate our sites, our websites, into all these systems that we need to integrate? And how are we going to factor in the fact that we have an exploding number of channels which we might be talking to our customers with and following up on leads and selling stuff? And in fact, this is one thing that is, is a really important trend for everybody in the Drupal community to know, is that we're now predicting that the chief marketing officers will now spend more on IT than chief information officers. And so what does that mean for Drupal shops? Well, for Drupal shops and Drupal users, you've been able to take the awesome power of Drupal as software and go to a technical audience and tell them why Drupal is great. And they've chosen to fund your projects and employ you for the last several years to work on Drupal. But that's changing now. That's no longer an audience that you can count on selling to. You're now going to have to sell to the chief marketing officer who's actually going to be in charge because they're trying to pull in not just the website, but the website plus the CRM plus the enterprise marketing management system plus uh, ownership of leads coming from all kinds of different channels. And so as a Drupal community, we're going to have to really understand what, are these, what do these marketing people value? What are they looking for? What do we have to do? How do we present Drupal so that when they look out there, they don't see Drupal as just a box of doorknobs um, that somehow open doors, right? They've got to see it as something that's integrating and coming, coming to them. So we're, we're going to have to figure out how to do that as a group. And, uh, and having some really great stories of success are really key. Part of that is going to be uh, our ability to personalize websites. And so um, when people log into websites today, typically their experience is either it's anonymous page or it's authenticated. But we started to tiptoe into this ability to personalize. And so, for example, we can have uh, explicit personalization where we can promote people. So some people have websites and they promote cer certain members of the, on the website to be community leaders or community managers. Some people can pay and get elevated, promotion, elevated, elevated, elevated roles, and so they have access to, to different information. And so they can see different things in their views and their panels. But we also do things like uh, when people do searches, based on that search and the content on the site, we can also do content recommendations. So now we're starting to look based on their interaction with the site, we're starting to prevent inf inf present information that might be useful to them. We also can have things like GOIP and be fed into the context module. So for example, when I was in uh, Australia last week, every time I went to search for something in Google, it would always ask to redirect me to google.au. Um, and I went to some Drupal sites and they automatically detected that I was coming from another country, and so they automatically redirected me and showed me uh, news or information from that particular country. And so these are the kinds of things that people are going to expect, and it's going to be very important because, you know, with the rise of Groupon, we've seen the importance of being able to have a local market and present local information. 
And so being able to use the GIP to sell local, local goods is going to be important. And then we've also seen a lot of experiments with A-B testing where people are trying out different things with different audiences and trying to figure out what's the right, what's the right uh, presentation to have. So I can tell you, for example, on Acquia.com, we have a downloads link. And downloads are the most common reason that people come to Acquia. And so we had a discussion internally for a while about whether downloads was the right term or whether we should switch it over to free downloads. And to us, downloads, it was implied that it was free. But we did an experiment, and we, so we used some A-B testing tools called Visual Website Optimizer, and we found out that about 1,000 people came to our site and clicked through, and from that we were able to find out that adding the word free downloads increased traffic by 15%. So this kind of ability to have tools that, that automatically look into your site and make statistical recommendations based on uh, different, different variants of what your website could be drives, uh, drives interest from the marketing people who are trying to personalize content and make things more relevant for folks. So these are the kinds of things that we're responding to, the revolution that's going on outside Drupal community and how Drupal is trying to adapt to it. We also have a revolution going on within the Drupal community. So this is a guy named Raf Koster. Um, so this is a gentleman named Raf Koster. He's a, a somewhat famous uh, game designer of large multi-person uh, multi games. And so he did a lot of research as he built games that had started some of the early games, online games that started to explode in size. And he wanted to he wanted to basically go and figure out how do I create these massive online communities and where am I going to run into trouble and how do I make them successful? And so here's a quote from him, and he says, he's, he's, this is in an interview, and he says, what are the main barriers to community building? And he said, one of the biggest hurdles is size. Communities tend to fragment when they get too big because it's hard to have interests shared that precisely and hard to communicate well with a large group of people. And reading sociology and anthropology stuff is really useful here. You can learn that there are really specific reasons why people work together for goals and really specific group sizes at which communications tend to break down and people need more hierarchy. There's also some nasty typical stages in evolution that communities go through that aren't appealing. Okay? And some of those sizes are typically 1, then 3, then 50, and then 500. And so these online groups would sort of cluster around that. And I would say in this community, we're probably around the 500. We've done something. You know, leaders from John and Chris and many of the people that were listed up earlier um, have been able to work through the tough parts of building the LA Drupal community and been able to come together, build out the infrastructure, the hierarchy to make this community scale to the size it is today. And I just got an email last night. I was trying to encourage one of the local communities in the United States to work together to launch a Drupal business summit. And I got an email basically informing that they'd already fractured, right? They had broken apart and were going to run two separate events. And so we'll see whether they have the collaboration and whether we can educate and train the people to build those collaboration muscles internally and come back together and have one event. Okay? And so these are the kinds of challenges that we have. And so this is something that the Drupal community has faced for many years. And so one of the things that we've done is we've created a maintainers list of people who look at different subsystems within the Drupal project itself, the Drupal software. And so we have these branch maintainers, and so about a year ago, we added uh, Nathan, Nathan Catch, or as we all know him, Catch, um, to be the Drupal 8 maintainer, and then we added a series of component maintainers. And so we've started to add some hierarchy within the Drupal community. And so some people worry, if you're not that familiar with how Drupal's built, that is it just a bunch of people chatting with each other on the internet? And in some ways it is, but in other ways we've got some hierarchy and we've got people who can make independence decisions or fairly independent decisions about how to organize and get pieces of the project working. And, and uh, this is an announcement of our, of our, uh, of our Drupal 8 maintainer. And so uh, Ketch is somebody who's worked in the community for many years. And in particular, what you know, Ketch had done for many years was he did a lot of the grunt work. Um, he actually went and what, did what was called re-rolling patches. So as patches came out, fell out of, out of date, he would go and re-roll them, and he would go and correct um, you know, basic you know, grammar and structure and, and, and syntax of the code. And then later on, he went on to go and do a lot of high-end high performance work and so looking at every patch and reviewing it with expertise for performance. And he had a very independent and critical eye. And so people felt that was really important to have somebody like that for the Drupal 8 branch. Um, we've also done a lot of things to improve the Drupal Association. So the Drupal Association is, is unusual uh, in a number of ways. Um, first, it started off in Europe. Um, uh, even though the bulk of the community, or at least the growth, the huge growth of the community started uh, primarily in the US, uh, where it really took off. And then it, and then it you know, started to grow fast again in Europe. And so uh, this is an article that I, I wrote with, uh, with help from some of my colleagues in the Drupal Association about the things that we can do in a path, as we set out about a path a year ago last week to try to make things better uh, for the Drupal project. 
And so I'm, I'm happy to say that as we look at year forward, uh, we've really made a huge amount of progress. So in that year, we've gone from having three full-time employees at the Drupal Association to 10. So a uh, tremendous amount of growth. We've built up the economic base to be able to support full-time employees, people who can really have the skills uh, to get things done. And so we've seen some great improvements. Uh, Megan has, uh, has broken most of her records for, for sales in terms of sponsorship for the Drupal Association. That leads to a margin that allows us to expand and continue to stabilize and hire other employees. We've had uh, Liz Trudeau, who's grown our membership from back when I was running it, uh, maybe uh, 700 people when I was as a volunteer running that membership to I think over 2,200 people volunteering and, and donating money at the membership. They've also launched a program for uh, association sponsors and have set and broken their records for the year uh, to be able to raise money where individual shops have said, we want the Drupal Association to have you know, some large sum of money that they can use to benefit the Drupal project. And so that's really worked out well. We've also uh, gotten getting ready for a transition. So uh, you know, back in 2006, we had a server meltdown. And uh, the, when we had the server meltdown, the server went offline and Drupal was down for several days. And so uh, Dries gave me a call and, and reached out to some members of the community and said, can you help us raise some money? I think we're going to have to get some new servers. And so a lot of interesting things happened. Uh, sometimes you know, the worst things that can happen to you are sometimes the best things that can happen to you. And so because we were offline, we managed to get on the front page of Slashdot.org um, asking for help with servers. And within, I don't know, maybe two or three days, we had about 50 different offers for free servers, which was great. Sun Microsystems jumped in and actually shipped us a server to a data center, now the OS, OSU OSL. Um, uh, open source, open source labs, and uh, and got that server infrastructure set up for us, and uh, we got ten thousand dollars in our bank account, which was a lot of money for, particularly for Dries as a college student, and uh, and so that led us to build up the Drupal Association, and so uh, Jacob was elected in the second second round of the Drupal Association, um, and he came in. Uh, he really wanted uh, local groups to be better represented. He felt really strongly that there wasn't enough coming out of the Drupal Association to, to represent those local groups. And so he wanted uh, financial support or fiscal agency from the association for his local New York group. And so he eventually uh, built that up for a year and as a board member and worked on that. And then he uh, decided to step forward and take on the job as the executive director. And so for two years, he's worked as the executive director and grown it from having no staff, really just large Drupal cons being run by volunteers to having full-time staff making things more stable and really allowing the community to focus on what they do best, which is creating content, creating programs and things like that, rather than running around worrying about getting water bottles and stuff like that. And so Jacob's now in transitioning and he's gonna be stepping out and we've had an announcement by Therese on his blog that he'll, that he'll move on. And so now we're looking for a nonprofit director who will take, who will t move into our Portland office and take the Drupal Association from a $3 million a year organization up to a $10 million a year organization and allow us to really continue to build up the infrastructure that this project needs to grow. And back when I started uh, many years ago, uh, IBM uh, was, in a, was in an interesting situation. They uh, had supported many different operating systems for their hardware, and so they were kind of struggling. And one day they decided that uh, they decided that Drupal or they said Linux was the way to go, and so they sort of kicked off the Linux the Linux revolution by announcing that they were going to support the Linux project with a billion dollar investment around their products. And so as we as you see the Drupal Association getting ready to go from a three million dollar a year organization to a ten million dollar a year organization, we're going to have some partners along the way. We hope that we see organizations like NBC, like Disney, like Fox, others who are using Drupal, other publishing organizations around the world declare Drupal as you know their publishing platform and really get it, get behind it and, and help us to grow. And so with what IBM did by backing the Drupal pro, or the Linux project, they were able to put together something in the order of a $20 million per year budget for the Linux Foundation. And I, I see the Drupal Association sort of following the same path. But we've got to, you know, every step forward is very difficult and we've got to earn the right to get there and earn the right for these large companies that use Drupal to really invest in the platform and add all the features that they need. Uh, one of the great things that I think is really important is... Uh, this enablement of staff and growing has been our ability to uh, do improvements on Drupal.org. And sometimes it's very frustrating. Drupal developers are extremely proud of, of, uh, of their websites. Uh, if you've ever tried to negotiate uh, changes to a DrupalCon website with the local organizing committee, it is uh, it's fairly painful um, because they just see everything as, uh, as you know, the quality of the website really representing their personalities and their skills and, and things like that. But so getting Drupal.org uh, to be improved is, uh, has been critical for the community for a long time. And I think Joel is here. Where are you, Joel? There he is. So Joel back there has been leading as, as one of our key project managers on the Drupal.org uh, project. Yeah. <laughs> and 
And so they've made great progress, and I think they're almost at the point right now where they've upgraded Drupal.org to Drupal 7. Uh, but as they're going towards uh, Munich, I think the decision was not to push the upgrade prior to Munich. Is that right? Okay, awesome. So if you're looking to get involved in helping with this Drupal revolution, uh, look for the tall, maybe the, maybe the tallest guy in the room. Um, <laughs> certainly one of the tallest guys in the room and uh, offer, to, offer to help out with, uh, with volunteering and doing QA and stuff like that. Great, we've got some handshakes going already. Awesome. And so we just had a sprint uh, just a few weeks ago um, in the Portland office. And so Joel and, and many of the people who were, uh, had previously volunteered flew up to Portland and were able to kick off the Drupal.org upgrade sprint. And so sometimes we work remotely, uh, but other times you know, when we need to get high quality bandwidth and get architecture solutions hashed out, we, uh, we run up and get together in the same place and do these awesome things in the Drupal community called sprints that allow us to really accelerate. And among the changes that these kinds of improvements bring for us is a change in the way we position companies and businesses in the Drupal community. And so we've had this preview page up here for a while of a marketplace. And so it's been challenging. We've uh, tried to figure out within the community who do, which businesses do we promote and how do we promote them. Is it the people who contribute to Core? Is it the people who contribute to Drupal.org? Is it the people who run the local camps? Is it the people who speak like user groups? Is it the people who do contributed modules? How do we value um, the and, and offer the prestige of being listed on Drupal.org? And so we're, we're getting close and we've worked out the rules and it's been a you know, fairly painful process over a couple of years to work out the rules in the community about what it's going to take to be listed on the Drupal.org marketplace. But this is going to be important for us because as people come and learn about Drupal, we want them to find high quality vendors. We want them to have a good experience. We want them to have lots of selection and competition. And so having a, a great list of folks um, in the marketplace is really important to getting that economic ecosystem around the Drupal project really kicking off. We've also started to expand internationally, uh, not just beyond, not just uh, the US and Europe or North America and Europe. We've uh, decided to go ahead and announce DrupalCon Sao Paulo. And so we'll be having that in December of this year. And this is a huge market, uh, a critical market for us, particularly the adoption of open source uh, in, in throughout South America is really important. And, uh, and PHP is a, a widely popular language, programming language uh, in Brazil and, and through South America. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to have uh, our first DrupalCon in Sao Paulo, and that'll take us up to three DrupalCons. And if that isn't enough, we need to expand to Asia. And so we've decided to upgrade uh, Drupal Camp down under. Um, all the way up to a DrupalCon. And so we'll be expanding to have our first DrupalCon in Asia as well uh, this year. So we're going to move up to four DrupalCons as we try to expand worldwide. And so this is really exciting. I met with the, met with the team, uh, the DrupalCon team, uh, just last week. Had beers with them on Thursday night. And there's a lot of excitement. Um, and a lot of people are already starting to talk about flying to it because it's an awesome place. They're currently planning on limiting it to 400. Um, and so I, I imagine they'll probably double that number uh, with people camping outside uh, looking for an excuse to get into DrupalCon. Okay, so, um, so we've talked a lot about the infrastructure and about building the community, but not everything has been smooth. Um, and so we've seen a lot of success in this last year. And there's a lot, of, a lot of great dedication and support by individuals to see past the small issues and really invest in the future. And, uh, and that's, that's been great. But we have had problems in the past. Um, this is the United States Patent Office Award for the Drupal trademark to uh, Gary Hipsher. Gary, are you here in the room? Okay. So Gary didn't start the Drupal project, but in, in 2006 he was awarded, in 2006 he was awarded the patent, and, or sorry, the trademark for Drupal. And so uh, those of you who use Drupal today would uh, potentially have had to to pay out to Gary, I'm not going to say what he was going to do with that trademark, but you know potentially we would have had to have paid out the license fees to him, and he could charge us for using Drupal, calling your, your shop Drupal, having a distribution. There's something like 495 distributions of Drupal on Drupal.org. Potentially we would have had to pay some revenue for Drupal.org, and so that was a real issue for the community that he was awarded uh, the trademark. Um, fortunately, we were able to appeal. And, uh, and so Dries, uh, shortly thereafter, started the trademark policy and went back to the U.S. Patent Office and argued that his application had actually been filed before Gary's patent, before Gary's uh, application had, and he was the founder of the project and was able to show cause uh, for why that decision to hand the, hand the trademark over uh, should be reversed and given back to Dries. And so, so Dries spent about 18 to 24 months working on a public tra trademark policy with the, with the Drupal community, and we got a lot of good input from people here in the L.A. area in particular uh, about how to, how to make it work and how to make it fair. 
And I think it's one of the fairest community policies that are out there. Uh, for example, if you look at the WordPress community, their policy around using WordPress is don't use it. You're not allowed to use it. It's owned by it's owned by one person and one company, and that's it. Even though they have a huge community, if you want to go to the Joomla community, um, I, you know, equally, I don't think their policy is anywhere near as fair. Whereas the policy around Drupal is basically you go ahead and use it um, as long as you're not blocking somebody out who does something similar to what you're doing. So if you're building Drupal church websites, you can't be Drupal for churches because there's more than one company that does Drupal for churches. You can't be the Drupal. Drupal enterprise because there's more than one company that services the enterprise market for Drupal. But you know, if you're if you're you know Bob's Drupal shop, then that's pretty unique, and so you're allowed to do it. And so there's a you know more more uh, more sophisticated interpretation of that policy that you can read in, but they try to be as fair as they can. And so this has been handed off to a team of patent of trademark lawyers who now handle this. And so people in the community who feel that they want to use the Drupal name and want to create Drupal products are certainly allowed to go and do so. And so they can go to the Drupal trademark and logo policy. And then this gets shipped off to a set of trademark lawyers who go and review it. Now, the problem is, is these trademark lawyers have invested a lot of money uh, being able to set up the rules and the guideline and being able to get the infrastructure in place to work out and resolve these issues. And so uh, there was as much as $50,000 spent last year uh, by Dries to, to enable this. And so that's one individual who's protecting the Drupal trademark away from you know, other people who may have taken over, uh, taken over the Drupal trademark. And so there's a fee. And so some people have objected to the fee. They think it should be free. And you know, I wish all lawyers worked for free, but that's not the way it works. Um, and, uh, and some of them think they work for free, but, but uh, they don't. And, uh, and so there's a fee to be able to get that trademark. And so we're trying to make that fair, but it's part of the rough part of a revolution. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the revolution that Drupal is enabling, and uh, this continues to be fairly timely. Um, so, and some of you heard me have heard me talk about this in the past. So, this is a website uh, called Al Jazeera, and there were a couple of guys who uh, moved to uh, Qatar uh, a number of years ago, and they stood up a site called uh, Qatar Qatar Living. Um, basically, young guys uh, traveling to uh, a new country without a, without a large social or family network. And so they set up this social community and it really took off. But their day jobs was working for Al Jazeera. And so they built out the English language section of their site uh, in Drupal. And as uh, the Arab Spring Revolution started to occur, um, they, uh, their site became more and more prominent as a go-to source, particularly for the English language news um, that people were counting on as independent, independent bloggers. And so uh, the military folks in Egypt uh, opposed to this level, were somewhat opposed to um, this sort of free speech, and so they arranged for uh, their paramilitary folks, or we believe that we arranged for paramilitary folks, to go to Al Jazeera's office and firebomb it, hoping that that would knock out their servers and knock out their capability to deliver. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, their servers weren't located in that office, and I don't believe anybody was hurt in that particular incident, but it did, it did you know, hurt them somewhat. And so as their site started to take off, it really started to get a lot of traffic and a lot of people around the world were watching and looking at these feeds. And these bloggers and people who were publishing to it were in the middle of hundreds of thousands of people in Tahrir Square. And so this ability to use Drupal to grow and to, to really push out their message, message became critical because all eyes around the world were watching them. Okay? And so Drupal was really key in, in, in the ability to, to publish and get the message out. And so those people today continue to make you know, really significant investments in scalability, um, in all kinds of different, uh, different platform techniques. And so as, as Drupal users, you're benefiting from people who are doing this kind of revolutionary innovation, whether it be technical or political innovation, adding features and things that you, you would want to be able to add. And so I want to take a moment to show you some examples, particularly around the mobile space, of what's going on. And so Semantic Connect is this great community site where they've replaced a significant number of the staff support people with a great community where people ask questions. And so they've made their website now uh, touch enabled. And so it's designed to, for both iPads and iPhones so that you can interact in this really in-depth in and deep community. And so this was built by um, a couple of, uh, a team of folks, including Jeffrey Dalton from Dalton Designs and Kevin Millicam, um, as well as some others uh, in their community who built the mobile version of the Semantic Connect community built on top of Drupal. Um, we've also seen a really cool app come out called Swifto, um, and so some of the folks uh, at, uh, formerly from Linovate 
and in partnership with their company, Linnovate, have built this really cool app that allows people to go dog walking. And so uh, the catch with dog walking is that people are really sensitive about where their dogs are and want to know at real time. And so you basically can do real time matching of saying, my dog's at home in my, par you know, in my apartment and I want a walker who's close by to come by, pick up my dog, take him for a walk. And then I also want them to be able to tell me where did the dog go for, dog go for a pee and where did it go for a poop. And so that kind of real time scalability and interaction is really key. Uh, unfortunately, Drupal um, uh, isn't necessarily designed for uh, that kind of real-time interaction. Um, and so we've added, uh, or so they added, uh, something called Node.js to allow for that kind of, so they can support 20,000 or more simultaneous parallel connections. And so they've also done it, uh, integrated Node.js with MongoDB in the back end to have a very, uh, a very large lookup of information. And then all the content and information editing is done through Drupal and MySQL. And so this is a great example of scalability and mobile uh, adaptivist and innovation. And everybody here in this, uh, in this audience who's thinking about using Drupal or is using Drupal will be able to benefit from the kind of innovative work that they've done. Uh, we've also seen uh, some, some interesting applications. So this is uh, Green Cab of Madison County. And so uh, this was a site that was built by Promise Source. And so you've seen, as you got into Cab, these proprietary boxes. What they've tried decided to do is reduce the cost of that. And so they've just mounted iPads in the front dash of, this, uh, of these cabs. And then they've built this mobile app with this interactive map. And then there's little pop-ups on here that show you where people are. And they can click and say, I accept, and then pick that person up and drive them. And so this is a great example of people doing really innovative mobile uh, work with Pal Power by Drupal. Uh, we've also seen another example here by um, Warner, Warner Music Group again, and so they've got uh, the band Kitten, um, and so what they want their fans to be able to do is to go to a concert or go out with their friends or where they're wearing a t-shirt, log in with their Facebook account, take a video, and automatically upload the video onto, onto the website and also cross-publish it to YouTube or Facebook, things like that. And so this is a mobile app that, uh, that we've been developing at Acquia, and some of the folks from Work Habit have been, uh, have been doing the actual development for it. And so that's going to be uh, coming out very shortly for uh, Warner as well as uh, as well as Drupal Gardens, and I think it'll show as a as a great knowledge base, uh, you know, potentially for uh, a high quality client, high quality mobile client, native client for Drupal. Okay. So the key message here is that uh, while we're going through these revolutions, we have to keep changing, we have to keep adapting. And one of the things that businesses are constantly being asked to do is to be agile, to be able to respond to the needs of their business, their customers. Um, we're getting a lot of pressure to continue to be profitable, and our companies are at all-time profits, and yet at the same time, they want us to continue those high margins of profit, save as much money as do more with less. And uh, it's very difficult. And we're always being asked to launch different kinds of websites. It could be a microsite, it could be a product site, it could be a support site. And so Drupal enables us to have that adaptivity and be able to launch all kinds of new and different kinds of applications. And so um, you know, Drup where Drupal works really well is its ability to customize for your business and its ability to be flexible. And so just like this chameleon, uh, Drupal continues to evolve through these different revolutions and continues to, to be an adaptive platform for building applications. So thanks very much. I'm, I've really enjoyed this revolution that we've been on. And uh, I think it's continuing to be and will continue to be uh, an important force in the world in terms of our ability to publish content, ability to democratize the press, democratize publishing worldwide. And uh, uh, thanks a lot. That's a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, joining us in this, uh, in this amazing journey. Thank you. How are we doing? Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes. Okay. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this one, this one here. Oh, sorry. This is a Green Cab of Madison County. So it's a mobile, it's a mobile app that's in the cabs, and then talking to Drupal on the back end. And it was built by a company called Promise Source. And if you do a search on those terms, you should come up see a one-hour webinar um, where you can get into more detail on that. Uh, it takes charges. It uh, locates where people have asked for a cab. Uh, so you can see on a map where people where cab requests have come from, and then it pops up and says you're this distance, and you can say accept. Yeah. What database are you using for that? Well, I can't remember. I, it's there's a very detailed webinar. They get into a lot of detail about it. Yeah. Chris. Hey, on Denver, there was a brief mention about uh, the dot gov space and Drupal. Yeah. And the money that Drupal is actually, you know, made. Uh, it was actually a large number. Could you speak to that for a quick thirty seconds? Sure. Um, 
uh, how much money, I, I don't know if I can address how much money's been made because I don't know that, but I can tell you that, um, I can tell you that about 125 national governments worldwide are now using Drupal at the national level, right? So, so in terms of bringing credibility to the platform, uh, that's, that's absolutely key. And obviously we're seeing a lot of prominent governments use them. Uh, I was just in Australia, in Canberra, speaking to a room of about 60 people in government there, and Drupal has become sort of the default go-to CMS, including uh, the, this, the website for the Prime Minister. Um, they did deviate in one case. They went and used something called Sitecore and uh, a .NET platform, and that project is now millions of dollars over budget and a year behind in schedule. And um, now, you know, there's, there's, there can be many valid reasons uh, but certainly one of the reasons I would say that, uh, you know, the government has gotten burned is traditionally they uh, have not been the most technically savvy uh, buyer. And, um, and the other thing is they've struggled to get talent. And so having a very large community and a very large ecosystem like Drupal allows them to reach out and get, uh, in a very fluid manner, uh, uh, talent and, uh, and skills. And so that's really helpful, and that's why a lot, of, a lot of organizations want it. They also don't necessarily enjoy the license restrictions that certain governments. Uh, in fact, while I was there, Adobe was getting criticized by an Australian senator because apparently they just sort of randomly, well, I don't know what they did, but they, they, they were certainly increasing the pricing, and it seemed like there was uh, what they were calling price gouging, uh, that particular market. Once they got locked in as a licensee, they would just raise the prices. And so governments like to be able to negotiate uh, and, and be free of those kinds of license restrictions. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a page on Acquia Doc. So the question was, uh, how much does Acquia give back? Was that, media, media. Did you ask Acquia? Or what? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, a page, there's a page on our site where we list all our contributions back. I think it's Acquia.com Drupal Give. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good list. Carry I was going to say that uh, Sitecore is interesting because it is the most aggressively anti-open source mm -hmm. company in terms of their marketing. Yeah. Uh, and they're probably, I, I would argue that they probably have the highest percentage of failed projects of, of any company of their network. Okay, great. Yeah. So Carrie's just talking, if you didn't hear what he was saying, he was saying that Sitecore has uh, gone out and started publishing um, I think they published a, an article or a, a, a series of PDFs called uh, The Siren Song of Open Source, and they basically took one person in Washington, D.C. and that had, a, that had a Drupal project that they couldn't figure out how to use Drupal, and so they used that and said that uh, it ultimately was more expensive and more difficult, and uh, you know, I think it was just that one particular shop. But they've, they've been pretty, they've been pretty um, obstinate and refusing to acknowledge that there are support options or enterprise options or that capability are available in the Drupal market in the Drupal marketplace, and so they continue to ignore uh, the strength of our ecosystem. You have a question? Uh, yeah, just thing uh, the, if, you know, we've talked in the past about uh, difficulty of Drupal penetrating uh, the marketplace because of, of resources and, and sort of yeah. finding Drupal resources. Do you feel like we're sort of starting to turn a corner on that now? Uh, community yeah. efforts, or like do you know, feel kind of more about it playing out? I think we have a plan. Um, certainly, this is a hot hot topic, so. Um, I know a, a couple of years ago there was a study that looked across the U.S. economy and, and said almost all of the economy is in recession with the exception of a couple of industries. And one of the, indus one of the top four industries they identified was the content publishing industry, the web content publishing industry. And so we live inside a bubble. And so it's not just Drupal, but anybody with web publishing skills whatsoever is in super high demand. And so there are a number of things that are being addressed to, to do that. Um, at Acquia, we have a training program, and so a lot of people have found it difficult and expensive to write and keep curriculum up to date across a wide range of things, so we've made that available to a partner ecosystem who are delivering dozens of things. Uh, the Drupal Association put together a Drupal training day and are doing a number of Drupal training days, so trying to motivate uh, people worldwide to uh, have training days and give free, free training, and so that, I think that's helping. We've also got a plan to go after university students and try to get into um, colleges and professors and make them aware of uh, Drupal as a career option because often people graduating from school uh, are only aware of um, you know, Java or .NET is the only thing they were taught in school. And even though um, there's, in many cases, the campuses are using hundreds of Drupal sites themselves. Um, I think that the Drupal user groups are a great way to continue to share knowledge. And I often see uh, people come to events uh, who are looking to hire and people who want to be hired. So that's a great point. Is anybody looking for a job? Okay, is anybody looking to hire? 
Okay? How about y'all meet over here? <laughs> okay, after we're done? Okay. Okay, great. Thanks very much. I have one, one question. Okay. Uh, with regards to the trademark, yeah. the intellectual property slide that you have up there. Yeah. Uh, were you specifically talking about the the uh, the name itself, Drupal? Yeah. Is, uh, it's trademarked. And then it, the word said cooperates with uh, the association. Does that, are you, yes, the, the one after that. Okay, yep. Uh, I guess it's controlled by Dries. Dries, yep. Yeah, Dries, I'm sorry. Yep. Who cooperates with Drupal? Does that mean the association now? Has the rights to it, or no? The rights are still held by Dries, but they're they're working out they're working out uh, the terms um, to to make it work. So, do you see that as some issue with regards to the uh, volunteers that are helping with this in an open source environment? The ability to use that. Yeah, I think I think um, I think Dries isn't you know I can't speak a lot, but I think Dries wants to be really careful and make sure it doesn't get screwed up and. Taking his time and being very deliberate and making sure that there's a solid organization that understands um, understands the legal fairness and understands uh, all those issues over the long term is something that that he wants to make sure happens. And so I think you can see for you know a good a good precedent for this was Lin Linus Torvalds got the trademark for for uh, Linux. And then over time, over several years, he was able to make it available to the Linux trademark organization, who then on his behalf goes out and does that. And so I think it's just a matter of how important is it to this community, how many people want to step forward on those legal issues and really build out that infrastructure. And you know, he's put a lot of investment in it too, so he, he wants to both protect it for the community and on behalf of the community, but he also wants to make sure that um, you know, his investment that, that's, that's gone into things is, is, is you know, recognized, uh, particularly when it comes to things like legal costs and stuff like that. Okay, so currently, the black and white of that, it isn't the Drupal Association potential uh, non-exclusive license or anything like that. It still belongs to Drupal. Still belongs to the Drupal, but he's got, a, he's got a very open policy um, that's fair and, and independently evaluated by, um, independently evaluated by a legal trademark team based on those rules. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Henry. I'll be around for a little bit if you've got questions.